So I know this isn't exactly a topical take, but The Queen's Gambit was easily one of my favorite shows of last year. I know, I like a show that wasn't Star Trek or some form of science fiction. It's crazy! I'm allowed to like things that aren't sci-fi, but you know, only one per year. Those are the YouTuber creator rules. It's like Highlander, there can only be one! Also, before we get much further into this video where I talk about some sexy times, can we all just admit I look terrible in this wig? I got the wig for my Beth Harmon cosplay. It does not look good, so we're we're just we're just we're just we're just gonna be done with that. But wigs wigs are not a Jesse gender thing, <laughs> at least not this wig. You want to see another bad wig? Go check out a video I did on Joker a while ago. But now that I'm in my much more acceptable attire, let's talk about Queen's Gambit, because I found the Netflix series, which gave us the coming age story of Beth Harmon, a chess prodigy in the 1960s, played by the amazing Anya Taylor-Joy, who struggles with addiction, loss, and her own mental health on her path to becoming champion, to be so completely refreshing. Not only was it just excellently performed, shot, and written, it was one of the few shows to center a woman at the heart of a troubled wonderkind champion narrative, a type of story that has almost predominantly been focused on dudes. But I want to talk about The Queen's Gambit for another very, very important reason. How damn horny it made me, because, oh boy, did this, this show... This show made me so horny like no other. Like, I needed a cold shower after almost every single episode. It's fine. I'm fine. <laughs> and no, it's not because I have a lady boner for chess, though, come on, we all know, th those knights, those knight pieces could get it. Nor was this simply because Anya Taylor-Joy is extremely hot and melts my poor bisexual heart, nor was it the fact that the show's costuming department was so on point for every freaking episode, much more than, than my wig was. All of that is true, and certainly didn't hurt my horniness as my earring falls. All of that certainly did not hurt my sexual feelings about the show, but despite getting me hotter than a Trekkie looking at Starship schematics, it actually took me a really long while to fully understand why the Queen's Gambit engaged my libido so hardly. Hardly? Hardly. In fact, considering that the show has very few sex scenes and literally no nudity whatsoever, it actually surprised me that The Queen's Gambit turned me on more than Ethan Peck's beard. And this continued to perplex me until I realized the reason I was so turned on is because of how much I related to how Beth was understanding and existing in her own sexual experience. Because despite me being a queer woman reading into the experience of Beth's straight sexuality, The Queen's Gambit portrays something that so rarely gets discussed, the sexuality and agency of autistic women. As a woman myself on the autism spectrum, I found that I saw my own awkward sexual experience mirrored in Beth's own journey in a way that I had never really seen before in a TV show or movie. Because we sadly live in a world that both desexualizes those on the autism spectrum and ignores how autism represents itself within women differently than it does in men. So let's make ourselves a little bit uh, more comfortable and talk about the neurotypical sexiness of the Queen's Gambit and how the Queen's Gambit accurately portrays female autistic sexuality. Been a long road, getting from, oh, hey, who, who, who the hell is that? Oh, uh -huh. hi, uh, I was just uh, preparing myself, let's say emotionally, for this video on the sexiness of the Queen's Gambit. So, um, while you're waiting on that, let's talk about today's video sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for creators where you can explore new skills, learn how to better approach your passions, and build your creativity. Right now, like, especially right now, it's important for all of us to be thinking about our self-care, which is kind of what I'm doing. Which is why I love the class, The Ultimate Self-Care Playbook with Jonathan Van Ness. Yeah, queer eyes Jonathan Van Ness. No one knows how to self-care better than that human being and I adore her. By joining Skillshare, you can check out their class and I really recommend it because he has so many good tips within it on how to take care of yourself and just generally be aware of your own self and body. But I'm sure no matter what, Skillshare will have a class for you. It's curated especially for learning, meaning there are no ads, and there are always new premium classes being offered, so you can stay focused and keep finding new ways to expand your creativity. 
and the first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description, you know, below, will get a one month free trial of premium membership. Anyways, now that I've said all that, I'm gonna quick go back to doing my own uh, self care so we can get back to this sexy Queen's Gambit video. Getting from bed here. Oh yeah, it's definitely gonna be a long road. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, I poured myself a little bit of boxed white wine because I'm basic and I make no excuses for it. <sighs> right from the refrigerator. But before we actually get to the sexy time, let's talk about how Beth Harmon works as an autistic character. Because neither the show itself, nor Scott Frank, the show's creator, or Anya Taylor-Joy herself, stated that Beth was intended to be autistic. Despite this unintentionality though, Beth clearly to me reads as an autistically coded character, and a surprisingly complex one at that, especially for a woman character. Media often portrays autism, which is characterized by a broad range of conditions that cause someone to face difficulties in societally accepted social and communication norms in fairly one-note ways. We see these sort of broad generalizations of what autism means in characters like Sheldon Cooper, Benedict Cumberbatch's Sherlock, or Rain Man. Incredibly smart or even genius level prodigies who are either arrogantly rude and or completely socially inept, and they lack much depth beyond that in their characters. Even more so, autistic traits are often only portrayed in male characters, reflecting the real world's lack of recognition of women who present on the autism spectrum. Over 50% of boys who are diagnosed with autism are found to have autism in their youth, compared with only 20% of women, showing how women's autistic traits are often ignored or misinterpreted. And most studies of autism focus on male subjects over female ones, leading to less understanding of how autism may present in female people. So it's fairly unique to see a female character like Beth be shown to have multiple subtle, interconnected, and authentically portrayed autistic traits. For example, Beth is often shown to be incapable of recognizing simple social cues in others. She's also often unable to predict how someone will react to her in social situations. She'll respond to those situations that she doesn't understand by simply stating facts rather than relating on a personal or emotional level with someone else. I didn't... I just felt... thought I was sick. My first time I threw up. Well, I still do sometimes. Actually, every time. Well, I have to get back. Oh, sure. She'll also respond to people around her with a complete lack of facial gestures as well, keeping a fairly monotone visage no matter what. She avoids eye contact in social situations as well. It's things like this, little character traits that portray a character specifically rather than characteristically and stereotypically, that leads a character like Beth to feel authentic in her autistic traits, and I talked more about that in my video on Sia's music. Instead of these autistic traits being given broad and inconsistent generalizations that change from scene to scene, Beth is portrayed with consistent, specific aspects to her character. Like how Anya Taylor-Joy chose to give Beth a unique and unusual speech pattern by having her clear her throat at awkward intervals while she's talking to other people. The way that the language progresses in the script, she actually starts to, she gains the language to be able to talk about her feelings. But if you look at the way that she communicates, especially at the beginning, it's very staccato. And instead of, like she hasn't learned how to open sentences yet. So she'll clear her throat a lot of the time because she just can't communicate with people. All of these add up to a fully fleshed out portrayal of Beth as an autistic character. And due to these traits making Beth appear socially awkward, she's often isolated from those around her and unable to understand how to navigate social situations. As a result, Beth, like many autistic folks, look for a distinct lens to understand and find patterns within the world around them in order to comprehend the incomprehensible social world. Often, this is done through hyperfixation on specific subjects or topics. Like for me, I often understand the world through the prism of Star Trek, relating my social experiences as if I'm an alien or a Starfleet officer trying to understand human connection for the first time. In Star Trek, I can find a way to look at scary social situations by grounding it in something that I can understand. 
For Beth, though, she quickly finds a deep fixation and love of chess. Chess for Beth is something that comes naturally to her. She quickly understands the rules and logic behind each piece on the board and how to play the game. It just clicks in her brain. And so she begins to use chess to understand social situations around her. At one point in the series, Beth describes why she likes chess. And anyway, it was the board I noticed first. The board? Yes. It's an entire world of just 64 squares. I feel safe in it. I can control it, I can dominate it, and it's predictable. So if I get hurt, I only have myself to blame. I could really understand that sense of loneliness and just trying so desperately to make sense of a world that didn't come naturally to her and that dependency on chess. The idea that, okay, this makes sense to me and I like this and this makes me feel comfortable and like I'm good at something. This world seems to want me. And I feel like a lot of what Beth goes through is her trying out different situations and seeing where she fits. Chess becomes a way for her to categorize and understand the world. Social interactions become a game. Different moves she can make in order to progress further in a conversation like she does on the chessboard. Each sentence becomes a move that she is making and then she waits for the other person to make a move back, like in chess. For artistic folks, once we find a way to relate to social interactions through our hyperfixations, we begin to strategize, to make moves far in advance. For example, I will often plan and practice conversations with people well in advance of actually having the conversation, as a way to reduce my anxiety going into a social situation. I do this whether it's an interaction with a boss at work or when I go into a party. It's all the same, I plan it out, I even practice it sometimes. Similarly, like how Beth plans out and practices a game of chess, she plans out and strategizes how to talk to people, to get what she wants from them. And this leads us to one of the issues that Beth faces, because she's filtering social interaction through chess, which is an adversarial type of interaction. So she begins to see conversation and social interactions as well as adversarial. She often doesn't immediately understand when people she meets want to help or get to know her, rather than wanting to play against her in some way, shape, or form. She doesn't trust people as easily because she doesn't see them as on her side, but as opponents. I'm worried about you. What on earth for? And this isolates her even further beyond just the isolation that her social awkwardness and autistically coded traits do. And this leads her to falling into using substance abuse like alcohol and tranquilizer medication to help cope with isolation. But all that stuff kind of falls outside the realm of this essay because it's time, finally, to get to the fun, sexy times. I know you were waiting for it. Often, autistic people, both as were presented in real life and in media, are portrayed as asexual. We're either thought of not wanting sex because of our social awkwardness or our fixations on other subjects, or two, we're infantilized for our artistic traits. So we're seen as someone who isn't really worthy of sex or wanting sex, as if we're adult children incapable of understanding what sex is because we're seen as incapable of dealing with the emotional complexity of it, or understanding the social aspects required to maintain a healthy sexual relationships. You don't even like people touching you. How are you going to have sex? Why on earth would we have sex? <laughs> to be clear, being asexual isn't a problem. In fact, it's totally awesome if you are. I may not be asexual, but if you are, I adore you, you are lovely, and I adore the asexual community. The issue is more that media representations of autistic folks often infantilizes autistic characters, which as a byproduct displays autistic folks as uncaring for sex, or even when these depictions don't infantilize us, almost always shows us as uncaring for sex. It's not that autistic folks can't be this way, or that asexuality is a problem, it's the ubiquitous nature and overprevalence of these stereotypical depictions of autistic characters that is the issue. While certainly some autistic folks are asexual or are uncaring for sex, many aren't such as myself. Though these stereotypes are somewhat indicative of some real life struggles that some autistic people may face when they have a sexual experience. And that is what the Queen's Gambit recognizes and displays through these struggles quite accurately. Because Beth does face a lot of struggles with her sex life, but it's not shown as if she doesn't want sex or as if she is incapable of understanding what sex means. Just that, because of some of her artistically coded traits, she has a lot of difficulty understanding and emotionally conceptualizing sex. 
First and foremost, in real life, autistic people are not infantilized adults incapable of wanting sex. In fact, sex can hold just as much fascination for us as it does for any other person, especially those going through puberty like Beth is. Throughout the series, Beth is shown to be interested in sex as she starts to become a sexual being during her pubescent years. In the first episode, she watches from afar as two teenagers kiss and seems fascinated by it. In the second episode, she quietly gazes upon two of her fellow students making out in the library. Like many of us, autistic or not, Beth finds sex fascinating to look at, and yet doesn't completely understand it, as few teenagers do, yet she still desires it, even if she doesn't understand it. Yet, the awkwardness informed by many autistic folks' social tendencies can create a struggle for many autistic folks to feel confident understanding or seeking out sex, or being able to engage with the social graces necessary to properly flirt with sexual partners, despite our desire for it. Despite looking like the amazing Anya Taylor-Joy, Beth is often incapable of really expressing sexual desire in social situations. Several times throughout the series, Beth is shown to be attracted to different men, yet they turn her down because she seems cold, aloof, unemotional, and uncaring. What about sex? Forget it. This isn't true, she feels very deeply as we see throughout the show, but she's also unable to portray that authentically to anyone around her in social situations as we talked about, isolating her. But for many of us on the spectrum, instead of our hyperfixations and obsessions preventing our sexual desires, they actually often inform and motivate them. For example, early in the series, Beth is shown to be uncomfortable with direct eye contact in social situations. Yet during chess, Anya Taylor-Joy performs Beth as unflinching, staring directly at her opponents. It creates an intimate atmosphere while she plays chess, probably the most intimate interactions Beth has achieved at that point in her life and she begins to feel comfortable with her opponents. So it's by no means a coincidence then that the people she begins to have intimate sexual relationships with are her fellow players first. Most of her sexual partners throughout the show are men who she's played multiple times in a game of chess. She's able to feel more intimate with people that she engaged with through her hyperfixation of chess rather than people that she met elsewhere in the world. Even more so, she treats sex like a game of chess, an act that two people engage in and perform specific moves in. And when something happens that she doesn't expect, she's unable to handle it, both in sex and chess. Even more so, once the actual game of chess is over, once the thing that she cares about is done, she doesn't know what to do. In chess, when the game is over, it's over. She shakes her opponent's hand and they go their separate ways. There's a finality to it. She puts an ending to things to cap things off and move on. And she tries to do the same thing in sex. At the end of her first sexual encounter with a Russian man, she pats him on the chest like she's shaking her opponent's hand, having that little bit of finality to the sexual act. It's adorable and awkward and reads entirely true. When she finishes having sex with Dudley Dursley later on in the show for the first time, which, by the way, when did Dudley Dursley, of all people, get so incredibly hot? Like, hot dang, whoo, damn, anyways. But when Beth finishes having sex with Dudley, she goes to reading a magazine, not understanding that most people want to cuddle or talk after sex, because she sees sex as a game, an act that's been finished, and now she can move on to do other things and doesn't necessarily need to care about her opponent because they're done. All of this creates, for me at least, an authentic portrayal of autism and sex. Yet, just because it's a good portrayal of sex with an autistic person doesn't explain why it makes me so, so horny. So horny. One second, I'll be right back. Damn it, damn it, Gordon, you do this to me. <laughs> Whew. Uh, anyways, uh, where were we? Um, <laughs> so why does this show turn me on so, so damn much? So damn much. Mm. Oh, God. Oh, I need that. Because often, personally, for me, I find sex scenes in most movies to be kind of boring. Well, I think it's partially because what we've been talking about, that Beth is portrayed as a character with authenticity in how her autism informs her sexual experiences. But I also think it's because the show also consistently subverts the trauma and pain associated with sex for both women 
and autistic folks in modern society, and allows those of us watching to just enjoy the sex on its own individual terms. Many media portrayals of women often focus in on the horrors and fears that many women have around sex in our modern day society. Given the fact that one in four women have experienced some form of sexual violence in their life, and many more have experienced some form of sexual harassment, this isn't exactly unwarranted. There's almost always an edge of danger in almost any sexual act that we have in real life, and that gets portrayed often in media as well. In almost any scene that is portrayed from a woman's point of view in a movie or film that has the potential to get sexy between a man or a woman, there's always this edge of danger that something could potentially go wrong. Think of how many scenes in TV and film start off with a man or woman in a sexual situation and everything seems normal. But it only ever takes one quick turn or line to show that a man might take advantage of his power or agency in a sexual situation over a woman. I mean, literally every single time that I see a woman get into the back of a car with a male character in the movie, I always have to kind of mentally prepare myself that while this scene might go fine, the scene might also potentially become a very, very charged and potentially sexually violent one. There's always this edge of it descending into potential trauma, even if the scene doesn't actually do that. And so I always have to place myself on guard in the situations and not able to really fully invest in feeling sexy in that scene because I want to be able to put my guard up at any moment so that I'm not investing in a sexual scene that may become violent. For example, take this scene from the movie Hunted. The main female character is out looking for a sexual encounter with a man. She finds a hot guy that she connects with, and the guy even helps her fend off an unwanted advance from another man. Oh. Hey, it's time to give up. You're bothering her. Everything seems to be going well, he seems like a good guy, and the scene seems to be playing this straight, like they're going to have sex and it's going to be a fun time. And so they go back to his car to have sex, and everything seems normal, like this scene is going to go fine. And then, this happens. Are you okay? Did I do something wrong? Uh, what are you guys doing? Instantly, a scene that was portraying a sexually positive experience becomes deeply, deeply sinister and dangerous. This quick turn is common in so many films that focus on women's sexuality and point of view. A sexual experience for a woman, both in real life and in shows, can quickly and easily turn traumatic with no warning. And it's something that a woman like myself watching a movie has to constantly be on guard for because it can come out of nowhere, as it does in real life. And by the way, I should make clear, this is not necessarily me condemning those movies or TV shows for doing that. This is a thing that happens in real life and movies or TV shows should reflect that. But it is something that all women watching a movie or TV show have to constantly be aware of and on guard for emotionally. And so it prevents us from fully ever investing sexually in a scene, unless we know beforehand that it's going to end up safely. But The Queen's Gambit actively eschews and subverts this trope. For example, in the series' first episode, when Beth is a young girl, she is sent alone down into a terrifying looking basement. And down there, she finds a lonely, quiet, older man, the janitor. Instantly, I bet many of you can see why someone would be on guard watching that scene. A small young girl with an older man in a quiet, secluded basement. That can become very dark very quickly, but it doesn't. In fact, the janitor becomes one of her closest friends and her first mentor. He teaches her chess and actively cares for her like an aloof but loving father. And it's honestly one of the most heartwarming and meaningful relationships in the entire series. Similarly, in episode 3, Beth is asked to go up to a hotel room to play chess with a handsome chess player. And they begin to play chess on the bed. And I remember watching this scene very nervously. I didn't want this guy to take advantage of her because they were in a hotel room on a bed. In any other series, this quickly would have become, at the very least, a sex scene, potentially a traumatic one. But instead, the series reveals at this moment that the man is actually gay. That there was never any real chance of a sexual encounter between her and this man. The tension is immediately diffused. And so, between these two scenes, the show subverts scenes of potential sexual trauma for women. And so the series creates an atmosphere of trust between us as the audience and the creators that the women's sexuality in the series won't become traumatic. 
And this was, by the way, the intention by the series creator, Scott Frank. This is the first of many instances where we experience a sense of dread on her behalf. You know, who is this surly custodian figure and what's he going to do? It's the first of many instances in The Queen's Gambit where we suspect the motivations of all the men she encounters. As if sexual violence were almost inevitable in the story of a strong, spectacularly talented woman. How consciously were you creating this particular dynamic? Very much. I mean, I wanted to play against expectation. And it's pretty apparent what anybody would think when she goes down into this basement and there's this older gentleman sitting there and this young girl asks him to play, teach her how to play chess. I thought so much of that was familiar that I could use that in a way that just kept flipping it on its head and not avoiding conflict because there's plenty of conflict in her life. But the truth is, the truth is that Beth is her own antagonist. And so you think the worst is going to happen, and it's not done to her by other people so much as she does it to herself. And so this allows women watching the series like myself to feel comfortable identifying into a sexual situation without fear of it becoming something triggering to watch, which does wonders for someone's ability to get turned on, let me tell you. It's sad where the bar is set that low where I get turned on by a sexual situation having no chance of becoming traumatic. Similarly though, because autistic folks are infantilized, isolated, and considered socially awkward, we're often ignored in sexual situations. Many studies have found that people see autistic folks as less desirable as sexual partners. Additionally, while women in general often face higher rates of traumatic sexual experiences, autistic people too face higher rates of sexual violence when we do have sex. Additionally, since we are often infantilized and seen as asexual, when we do report our sexual experiences to police or other organizations, it's often ignored. Additionally, on top of all of this, because we are often isolated because of our social awkwardness, we feel lonely and frustrated. So when we do have sex, we often want to try to please our partners because we don't want them to leave us. So we become hyper-focused on pleasing our partners. We're never allowed to really think of ourselves in a sexual situation. Yet, subverting this as the protagonist, Beth is allowed to focus on herself, and the story lingers on her agency in sexual situations. She's never taken advantage of, even when she's frustrated by her inability to relate to her partners. And while she is isolated at times throughout the show, and even self-isolates physically through substance abuse, she's always pulled out of it by those around her who care about her. This sometimes doesn't happen for many autistic folks who often get ignored, as I said. Even further, to my mind, the series never hypersexualizes its lead. Yes, Anya Taylor-Joy is definitely portrayed as beautiful and elegant, but it never feels gratuitous, at least to my view. The series never even features a nude scene. It's nice to have a lead of a show who is hot, sexy, and looks great, but never feels the need to over-highlight that fact. It allows Beth to never feel otherized by the camera, where we're ogling her at her body as a hot woman like many other films and TV shows do, yet it still manages to make her feel sexy. So all of the subversion of trauma and sexualization creates a unique sexual atmosphere for women and autistic folks to identify into the series that few other shows ever achieve. One that feels both safe to invest in, realistic to a degree, and yet also somewhat fantastical because it presents a world free from these traumatic experiences. I don't have to worry that I'll be put into a situation that I don't want to identify into. Yet I also feel a sense of sexual fantasy while watching the show. All of this while the show is creating specific struggles for Beth, specifically to how she sees the world as an autistic person. When Beth's partners try to relate their struggles to Beth about how she treats them or views them during sex, she finds it difficult to communicate back how she feels, because discussing emotional issues verbally can be difficult for autistic folks to express, especially in a sexual situation. Yet this is never portrayed as something that is couched in trauma or pain, but simply just an aspect of how she exists as an autistically coded person. And that's what I really love about Beth's portrayal as a sexual being. Her artistically coded traits both inform and create obstacles to her sexual life, but it never ever precludes it, nor does it descend into trauma. Instead of being an asexual being or being forced into celibacy, she's shown to have a vibrant sexual life and sexual desire, one that often can come into struggles with who she is as a person, yet still eschews the stigmas and violence associated with being a woman and a neurodivergent person in today's society. And that is exactly why I find the show so damn sexy, why I get so turned on. Because as an individual, I can read myself into Beth as a person, yet it also just feels fun, exciting, hot. Like something I'd enjoy in my own spare time alone, if you catch what I'm trying to put down. 
So, now that we're, uh, now that we're done, uh, Mama's got some, uh, got some things to take care of, I think. Uh, so I'm just gonna take a, take a picture of that sexy Dudley Dursley and, um, do my own thing. So, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the Queen's Gambit below. Uh, and, uh, I'll see y'all later. Thanks for watching. Thank you so much for watching this video. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. I'd love to hear your thoughts about the sexiness of The Queen's Gambit. Also, don't forget I have a second channel called Jesse After Dark, which is very apropos. You can find me being my neat, nerdy, geeky, dorky self over on that channel. Uh, but beyond that, now it is time for Jesse to uh, find her chess master, if you know what I mean. So if you'll just uh, excuse me. Thank you all to my Patreons. I couldn't do it without you. Morgan the Pirate Queen, Joe Herman Holt, Miranda Janelle, Ela Berg Moss, Catherine Lambath, Ashley Allen, Bo Kikio, D. Kessaray, Greg Gillum, Stephen Kleinard, Jem Shin, Alex Miller, Each the Mad, Randy Thompson, Wellington Marcus, A Man Chooses, A Slave Obeys, Bass, Boyd Earl, G Man 42, Felicia Toast, Mary Mello, Joseph Dewey Bush, James Krivda, Elizabeth Christian, Barbaruski, Stiff and Shoehart, Aliyah Kai Gooch, Dominic Noble, Buttoneer, Mountain Harpy, Mina Carroll, Jessica Wright, Nathaniel Froughton, Mac the Edge, Peter Landers, Jared Johnson, Ferengato, John Steele, Wind is a Bizzle Geek Filter, Barba Heelchuck, Cecil Dawn, Melinda Walters, Eva Kaneva, John Weatherby, W. Randy Edie, Meta Whisper, Pissed and Twisted Garage, Ulysses the Pagan, Beatrix Purvis, Casual Observer, Alex Owen, Lysa, Keith Briggs, Angie Pugh, Amanda Ronye, Idania, Odd Just Odd, Maggie the Goblin, Tiffany Danger, Candyman, 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 Candyman. Emily Loomis, Flynn, Gretchen Badger, Jessica Chapman, Chloe Dollar, Lamia, Kalis William Stewart, Andrew Lamoro, Sarah Bystam, Sky Skignar, Laura Demero, Nathan Steele, Noble Monster Comics, Mary Mack, Jacob Tovar, Lily, Hia Reeses, Andrew K, Sean Piper, Troy Stull, Maeve Jason Knott, Munir Amlani, Nikki Gordon Bloomfield, Crit Fax, Polly Mina, Shrib Machine Berlin, Strawberry Pup Tart, Michael Hardy, Michael Goatee, Zone One Librarian, Jenny Marble, Pasty, Ver, Philip Hawkins, Mark Brown, Andy H, Kelly, and Vale Honkin in. Thank you so much, patrons. You are literally the best. Thank you for allowing me to do this. I couldn't do it without all of you.